Welcome everyone. Thank you for attending this meeting of the Economic Development and Skills Policy Committee. The meeting today is open to the public and will be webcast and the recording will also be available for people to view later on through the Council's website. It's also possible that Sheffield Live TV will record and rebroadcast this meeting. We have received no questions from the member or members of the public. Please can I request that mobile telephones and other such equipment are switched to silent mode so as not to disturb the conduct of the meeting. There is no fire test plan today. If there is an emergency evacuation, please take instruction from the town hall staff and the assembly point is Judah Square. Um, so if we could introduce ourselves, please, we'll go around from this side. Good afternoon, members. Um, I'm uh, Robert Parkin, um, the Assistant Director for Legal, advising the committee today. Hi, I'm Minesh Parikh. I'm the Deputy Chair of the committee. I'm Laurel Moynihan, Labour Councillor for Manor and Castle. Good afternoon, Abdul Qiyum, Councillor for Firth Park, member of the committee. Um, it's Councillor Brian Holmshaw, who is a councillor for Broomhill and Shower Vale. Uh, councillor Henry Nottage, councillor for Hillsborough Ward. Councillor Shetley Fox, uh, Manor Castle Ward. Councillor Curtis Crossland, councillor for Baton Ward. Barbara Masters, councillor for Ecclesall Ward. And I'm Councillor Martin Smith, councillor for Doran Totley and also chair of the committee. I ask officers to introduce themselves when it comes to the relevant part of the agenda, if that's okay. Super. Apologies for absence. I haven't had any today. Um, exclusion of public and press. Uh, as I said earlier on, the meeting is open to the public. However, I think we're all aware that there is an appendix to the report on item 11 uh, where the information is not available to the public or press because it contains exempt information relating to financial and business affairs. If members wish to discuss the information in that appendix, we'll need to ask um, officers to temporarily switch off the, uh, the webcasting facilities, if that's okay. Declarations of interest. Do any members wish to declare an interest on any items on the agenda? That's a no. Thank you very much. Um, minutes of the previous meeting. Um, that was the meeting held on the 13th of September. Um, <coughs> I wasn't there due to illness, but for those of you that were there, are those minutes okay? We'll take that as approved. Thank you very much. As I said earlier on, we have no questions or petitions from members of the public, and we also have no questions from members which leads us neatly into the work programme, which you can find on page 19 of the agenda. Um, I don't know whether it's yourself, Amanda, or Diana wanted to raise anything on that. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to draw your attention to the referral from Council that's on page 20 uh, and the proposed um, action that has come from that. Aside from that, I don't think there are any major amendments, unless Diana wants to add anything. Nothing from me at the moment, thank you. Thanks. Just one thing for me, I did note that the agenda for the next meeting in, I think it's the 20th of December, does look quite slim. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I'm just wondering if there's anything that might be ready to bring forward from the following meeting. Um, or whether the members have anything they might want to add. Laura. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm just wondering, Diana, if the skills strategy be, would be ready any earlier. Um, we've, got the, we've got the budget uh, today for discussion, but we're having budget discussion before a strategy discussion. 
which seems a bit limiting. Um, the, the skills strategy won't be at a point earlier in December to bring forward. You've already seen the specification that's gone out to market. We're in the process of procuring at the moment. So we'll still be in onboarding procurement phase at there. So February probably is the earliest. The thing that we could potentially ask to be brought is um, South Yorkshire MCA are developing a skills strategy at the same time. It might be that you would wish to see that or the local skills improvement plan, which we'll obviously be talking to. So we could ask if we could line any of those up, if that's of interest. Um, if we could see the Simca one, that would be very helpful, I think. I think it, in, it would in, uh, inform our discussions when we do come for February or whenever. Thanks. Um, Brian? Um, yeah. Um, good. Now I'm going to be asking some questions about heritage later. Um, uh, I'd like to refer us to that strategy update. And uh, can I ask whether um, heritage skills are included within that culture strategy or not? And can they be if they are not? Can I have an answer to that, please? Um, yep, I don't think that's a work plan question unless we want to bring it forward, but um, I can answer it now anyway. Um, the culture strategy will um, reflect its relationship with heritage because they are an entirely symbiotic, particularly intangible heritage. Um, however, we have just adopted as a council a joined up heritage strategy in February, and we're working with the, joint, the heritage partnership at the moment in terms of how we're supporting them. So it's quite, a, I think it's a Venn diagram. You still need a, that joined up heritage strategy because there's a lot more about built heritage within there and the culture strategy, and there'll be an area where they cross over and talk to each other. Um, so we are exploring that in the culture strategy. We had the first meeting this week and this point was made. Um, so we will be talking to the Heritage Partnership as part of the development of the culture strategy. But what we're not doing is forcing the two things together. They, they will sit um, and talk to each other. Okay, thanks. Um, Minish, Thank you are indicating. Thanks, Chair. And thanks, Di. I think just two general quick things. I know we had a draft paper on social value. I wonder if that could... If that might be a stage where it might be ready for December. And then just on the referral from full council uh, about investing uh, opportunities for renewable projects, I wonder if we could get a written update about the energy efficiency grants that this committee has distributed both to SMEs and community organisations and how much is left, whether there is a further job of communicating with other partners to maximise those. Okay, thanks for that. Um, can I, I'll take one and only one more because we need to crack on. Brian, is it about that or something else? No, it isn't. I'm sorry, Martin. It's uh, it's in connection with the item uh, which is going to be brought up. No date is agreed yet. Page 29. So this refers to an LGBTQ quarter. And I'm just questioning the terminology here about whether it should be that shortened version of what is usually LGBTQI+. So can we have a, can I have a response to that, uh, either here or at a later date? We want to consider the aspects of that. Happy to have those additions. That was something added to the work programme from this group. Um, it's something we are still working in the background of. I think TRC are also interested in that, so Will Stewart is doing some work around there. And I'm also looking at Pride as part of the events programme. So there's work going on in the background there. But to take your point, we can actually we can make that change and add the full um, spectrum in, no problem. OK, thank you for that, colleagues. I'm going to draw that item to a close. Obviously, if anybody's got anything um, else to contribute, we can do that by email or contact officers direct, if that's OK. Which leads us on to the first substantive item, which is item eight, a presentation on the activity of Marketing Sheffield. And we have uh, Diana and Emma and Wendy as well. Okay, so uh, um, over to you guys. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm just going to let Emma take the lead on this, basically. So um, um, I'll hand over to the team and I'll um, support on questions as needed. Thank you very much. Um, we have two screens. 
um, you might find um, that the resolution on some of the, um, of the screens are slightly small, so you'll find a lovely printed copy in your pack, which is fantastic. Thank you, Amanda, um, which might be easier to refer to. Um, I'm Emma France. I'm the Service Manager at Marketing Sheffield, and I'm uh, joined today, um, thankfully, by my colleague, Wendy Ulliott, who's the Marketing Manager for Visitor Economy. Um, thank you. Um, for letting us come to talk um, a little bit more about the actual activity that we do on a day-to-day -day basis in Marketing Sheffield. What we've tried to do is just put together a bit of a whistle-stop tour of recent activity and initiatives just to try and bring it to life for you. Um, we're very conscious that you read a lot of committee reports. Um, there's a lot of words in there and not many pretty pictures. Um, so hopefully this will actually allow you to see the type of things that we do um, as a result of those papers that we kind of talked to you about and the reasons um, for, for those. Um, and you should be able to see a little bit more in depth of what we, uh, what we get involved in. Um, so Marketing Sheffield, a small team with a very big job. Um, we are 7.5 full-time equivalent staff. Um, sometimes it might not feel completely clear um, what we do, the differences between external and internal markets and, and, and groups. Um, and also, we know that marketing means different things to different people, and we'd probably all have a different um, answer if we talked about what, we, what marketing kind of means to us. But despite how complex it all is, it's also quite simple um, in many ways. So this is our single rule of thumb, no matter what our audience activity um, or market, stronger perception of Sheffield increases the willingness um, to visit which drives economic value, and that's basically our mantra for kind of why we're here in all of our activity and all of the strategies that we're, we're working on. And within this, we can be flexible, we can be creative. Um, it allows lots of tolerance for things that are out of our control, but as long as they're actually contributing to this um, fundamental um, rationale and, and, and reason for doing things. So I just wanted to touch slightly on the brand before we talked about the activity. So obviously, Marketing Sheffield is... I suppose the guardian of the Sheffield brand, um, whether that's the visual identity um, or the work that went behind um, how we talk about Sheffield and, and the, the ways in which we describe um, what's happening in the city to other audiences. Um, we talk a lot about building the reputation of Sheffield and, and, and Sheffield is our brand. There are lots of brands out there, but Sheffield fundamentally is our brand. And this slide really demonstrates its, its flexibility and how it can be um, applied really to different um, different scenarios. So the Sheffield makes is a fundamental part of that. So you can see how Sheffield can make experiences. It can make Dockfest. It can make the modern rules of football. It can make jobs for the future. It's very very flexible um, in terms of um, in terms of how we use it. And it's meaningless really without the people who do the making because no matter what it is, there's a person somewhere involved in it. And that allows us to humanize kind of Sheffield and Sheffield makes. It gives it personality and character. And it makes marketing a whole lot easier when you're talking about the people that do things and the people that bring, um, bring the city to life. Inventive is essentially what we call our brand archetype. Um, it's been present as far back as, uh, as the 12th century um, when archaeologists found evidence of the making culture around the castle, which was producing things that were be, weren't being produced elsewhere. And people and their inventiveness create connections, emotional and meaningful, between other people. And it's where you get the magnetism and that emotional pull for people to visit or invest um, in the city. So practically, this is what we did when we kind of got the brand um, and, we, and we looked at how we applied it. So um, we updated all the areas of work that we're involved in. So that's invest, business, conference, and marketing to be in line with the city brand. So, and they're all delivered through our website kind of um, uh, fundamentally in terms of, what, in terms of what we do. So we made it all look part of a family to start off with. So that was how we kind of acquired that brand. So you can see, obviously, you've got essentially what our service is really, I suppose, but you can see how Business Sheffield looks akin to Marketing Sheffield um, and the Invest team um, and also the conference team. So it's all, all speaks as one family um, of people who are trying to achieve the same thing. So let's move on to a few of our kind of campaigns to bring those to life for you and, and, and show you kind of what we really, really do. So um, in 2022, we launched your University City campaign with both of the universities. Um, this is, as far as we know, an industry world first um, in that universities normally promote themselves um, as a university. They don't normally promote the city first, but our universities were quite um, 
forward thinking and the fact that they knew that if people went to the Sheffield, then, um, then they weren't likely to choose their university. So they were um, very ambitious um, um, and very brave, really, to work with us um, on this. And this is all about targeting 16 to 19 year olds when they're trying to make their choice of which universities they might have a look at. Okay. Um, you can see the video um, on the Welcome to Sheffield website, and I'd encourage you to look at the Student City page there and have a look at it because it is uh, it is quite exciting in terms of um, in terms of how it looks and feels, and it's definitely um, made for that audience. Um, or perhaps you might have already seen it, um, but you might have had to uh, be a Love Island watcher because those were the kind of um, public those were the kind of TV um, programs that we were um, placing it um, near. The first six months results, we had a 73% brand uplift for awareness for Sheffield in this target audience. And the industry benchmarks say that about 25% is a top score. We had 73%. 46% brand uplift for purchase intent, so the desire to go to a university in Sheffield. And industry benchmarks say that around 12% is a brilliant score. So we had 46 so the initial six-month pilot turned into a three-year um, approach, um, and we're now kind of we're about to go into that final year actually. So we'll all be looking at kind of you know the success and, and what we do going forward. But it's been featured in UCAS marketing campaigns, um, case studies, higher education awards. We've been shortlisted for um, different um, awards in the HE Awards, place marketing events, and it's it's really um, it's really kind of got out there in terms of the, the success of doing something um, very different. And then, as I know, um, a number of you have seen earlier this year, we launched what's believed to be another world first, um, permanent free augmented reality art trail. Um, look up as part of a part, part and parcel of, of our built environment across the city centre. Currently, we've got five sites in the city, prominent locations on iconic buildings, um, and we've got exciting plans for a sixth to be revealed in the new year. Ideally, we'd like to see this grow as, a, as an extended trail to sit alongside street art, our home of football, and the other kind of innovative ways of exploring the city's culture, heritage, and architecture. Much of that will get drawn out as we, we move between kind of the culture strategy and heritage and destination management plan, all of the plans that are coming together. The Look Up campaign has been another great example of, of really what's been made possible via a shared prosperity fund and um, collaborative working, and it's not without partners, um, or with, without partners, this just wouldn't be possible to, um, to move forwards. 2023 also so has launched yet another City Breaks campaign, a targeted campaign um, where, again, SPF funding has been able to show real project impact for us. We were, pl we were planning a kind of City Breaks offer, but then we got the time out accolade um, of being kind of second um, best city break in, in Europe. So we've absolutely maximised that where we can. That's really helped us in the timing of the work and using it to our advantage. We've gone a step further um, than the kind of montage film that we've used currently. And we've custom, custom shot videos um, for different perspectives and different audience segments, and which have been really well um, received and very effective. We've had those running across digital channels um, in advertising, driving traffic to landing pages on our website. And we've been totally authentic in the stories that we've told in those, visit in those videos and um, working with businesses and people, organisations and venues so that locals and residents can get behind the campaigns, feel as if they're part of it. So far, it's given us some really strong metrics in our target audiences. We'll show you a little bit more about this later in the presentation, but we're certainly seeing uplift in London, Birmingham, Manchester and Leeds. Those destinations which are two hours or so, easily accessible and but worth, worth travelling in from. So we've got some incredible conferences um, here in, um, in the city which bring in um, business visitors. Um, in 2022, um, the conference sector was worth about 70 million. Um, to the city. Mainly they're unseen, they're behind closed doors, a lot of the time you don't really know that they're going on unless you're involved in them or you go to them um, and we hear often around the fact that we don't have a purpose-built conference centre like some cities but with the research specialisms and expertise that we have in Sheffield, conferences are still very powerful ways of telling the world where Sheffield leads the way um, and we're very lucky to have um, a section of our team who are experts in bidding for conferences, both domestic and, and international, and do so 
um, regularly. And then we have the emerging markets um, that you might have heard of, known as Bleisure. So Bleisure is business plus leisure. Um, traditionally, it's about extending your business stay for pleasure. So you might go to a conference in Barcelona and you might choose to stay for a while. Um, it grew slightly more steadily in the UK, as you would expect. Um, but we are definitely seeing now, as people have closed offices and they're not necessarily based at a, an office location, they are looking for destinations to take their team to. So they might want a day of updates, creative stuff, and then they want to kind of have a networking event or they want to go out for dinner or something like that. So that's where we're, we're, we're focusing at the moment. We have some real success um, around those areas. Well, the exciting world of data, here we go. So STEAM is um, an industry recognized um, model that is used across core cities and lots of other destinations. And if you're wondering, STEAM's the acronym for the Scarborough Tourism Economic Activity Measure, and that's where it was first developed. Um, as I say, it's used right across core cities. It's gathered from various stakeholders, so it's, it's data that we push in through um, a, a formulaic model. Um, and as with any data, it's only as good as the data we put in, but we have a number of um, stakeholders who help us deliver that city centre footfall and um, visitor numbers from um, key venues. We've talked about some of this um, previously. It's not perfect, but it does give us a, a rational benchmark um, to, to work from. Um, good news from this, this one. Um, we wondered where we would be post-COVID. Um, the value of the visitor economy in 2022, as you can see, um, was just 0.7% uh, below the 2019 figures, um, although our numbers of visitors coming in um, was 11.9% was lower than in 2019. Um, decrease in numbers is more significant, uh, more significant across day visitors rather than staying visitors, which is good. That shows good, strong hotel occupancy, and that's quite consistent. And the... the, the can the, the excuse me the decrease in numbers is pretty much showing out bearing out across a national picture there we can take some assumptions and um, from what we're seeing we know if uh, inflation has affected some of the costs cost of living crisis is impacting on people's propensity to travel again most noticeably in that day visitor market Although fewer people visited, clearly they're willing to pay, for, pay more for their experiences. Um, it accounts for inflation and increased cost of hotel stays, but we are cons consistently seeing that uplift in spend. Um, the downside of all of this is unfortunately the impact of the downtown, downturn is reflected in the number of full-time equivalent um, jobs supported. Um, so it's reduced by, again, similar to our visitor numbers, um, just over 11 percent and reduction down to 13 uh, 13,285 full-time equivalents um, again on good news and um, we'll keep trying to push forward with what we have um, developing the tourism offer in very in different ways and um, as well as promoting can kind of city breaks looking at what are the specific drivers for bringing um, visitors to Sheffield one example, as we know, is around events. We've got some major plans um, in place, again, funded by uh, shared prosperity funding. So that's, that's been really key in developing some of our um, campaigns. This event will see the central lift tower of Park Hill turned into an urban climbing wall for about a week with celebrities taking place for um, charitable causes. Public will be able to have a go and some of the world's best known climbers will take part in a speed climbing competition. Um, again, not massive numbers, um, but absolutely high profile. So we're expecting national coverage, international coverage across the um, kind of travel, destination, all genres of media there. All of this can only be done if it's supported by local businesses and experts, of which we have a number. Um, we'll see a launch party. I'm sure there'll be invites being circulated and there'll be some merchandise. Um, but hopefully this is a blueprint for something that will happen um, on a, say, a regular basis. We think every two years or so would be a really good um, platform to go with. I mentioned media um, and we've had some successes um, quite recently. We often talk about how we reach our audiences via social media. Um, 
But in fairness, our accounts will rarely outreach that of the established platforms, um, both digital and traditional with national titles. Um, we've used culture, we've used heritage, we've used architecture. Um, all of those combined to, find, to form really good stories about the city. We know that. But compelling features across media obviously raise the profile of the city. And the good news there is that it's often at little, little or no cost to us. Um, I think that's really kind of quite important to note. And whether it's the Telegraph, as you see here, or the Daily Mirror, different audiences, very different demographics, different views. The profile we gain should never be underestimated in, in kind of traditional media, particularly where it's both print and digital. Here's another example. This was a last minute that pulled together quite nicely for us. A call on a late on a Wednesday afternoon um, for a travel writer who wanted to come on the Friday. Um, but the strengths of our relationships with stakeholders made it possible for this to, to go ahead. Three pages across the Daily Mirror, syndicated to the Express and some regional titles, and again, in both print and digital platforms. Um, it cost us the cost of rail tickets and, and a couple of nights in a hotel. Um, just as an example, hotel, uh, one of the restaurants that was part of that feature offered a 50% discount to the journalist and threw in a complimentary bottle of wine. So not much cost involved there and sold 40 covers in the restaurants during the week following publication of this. So again, stakeholders seeing real value and tangible results from some of the work that we're, we're doing. Um, so we will continue to, um, to, to support journalists. We were a little bit worried on various publications, but actually, um, that's for people who read those publications to decide whether it's a great destination or not. You know my view on that one. Okay, okay so um, just um, a little bit on the Welcome to Sheffield website. I hope you've all been on it, looked around, seen what you can do at the weekend. Um, so it's the home to all of our campaigns. It's, the, it's where everything um, is centred. Um, and it was relaunched in April 2022 after a lot of work, um, a lot of which happened during the pandemic. Um, and it's a really useful platform um, for both internal and external visitors. So although our focus is on external, it's a fantastic resource for everybody um, who wants to know a bit more about, uh, about Sheffield. So this is where I would encourage you to refer to your um, uh, printed documents, because um, it's, um, it's quite difficult to, to see up there. Um, so since all of this activity, our web stats have gone through the roof, to be honest. I know that's not a technical term, but it is actually it is true. Um, this is a snapshot, um, as it does really change um, every week. Previously, our annual traffic was around about 250 to 350,000 um, visitors per year. Um, in this five-month period, which we looked at around the, um, the campaigns that we were running at the time, around city breaks and the university, um, but also because of wider activities to promote the city, um, everything just kind of went mad, really. It kind of like just all suddenly started to, uh, to go up and up. As of yesterday, where we used to have about 2,000 um, visits um, per day, we're now up to um, about 8,000. So you can see kind of the trajectory of um, the interest through the website based on all of the activity that's happening. But it's important to say that about 80% of this traffic is organic. So even though we're paying for stuff, this is not all about paid for activity. So we are seeing people looking for Sheffield and we're servicing that need through the content. So Sheffield was a top location um, by traffic if you look at kind of where people were coming from originally. But we've changed that. And now you can see London, Manchester, Leeds, Birmingham in the mix. Um, areas that we're targeting in the campaigns, as Wendy said, because of travel time. We've seen places like Plymouth pop up, um, and we know that there's little, some synergies there with um, advanced manufacturing and people kind of coming up there. So we can start to see the reasons that people are coming from outside of the city. Our top pages used to be quite random. They were kind of, if somebody was coming to Dockfest and we knew that was happening, it would go up. If we had women's euros, obviously that would be, um, you know, there'd be a big spike. But um, now our top pages are what we want to see people to see so they're looking at the inspirational content that we're actually writing and putting out there and engagement's also good people are reading the stuff so they're not just hopping on and, and, and disappearing again so it's quite hard because a lot of our data is like steam and it looks at value and economic value so this allows us to kind of have some insights into where where people are and obviously there's a next phase um, of looking at that where we can kind of match the interest and what people are looking at via the website to them actually visiting, um, you know, and that's a, that's a big challenge for us and something that we're, we're, we're looking at and seeing how we can match that. So just to conclude, really, um, 
it leads us back to the strategies and plans. So all of those lovely things that we're very fortunate to get involved in um, on a daily basis comes back to the jigsaw, as we tend to be um, calling it at the moment. So the red and the green on the left-hand side um, are the things that I've just talked about. And there's a lot more going on in those spaces that we've just kind of picked out some of the, um, some of the highlights. Um, but they all link into the core strategies for growth. We're going to talk about events, we're going to talk about the destination management plan, um, and you know about the um, accreditation for the Local Visitor Economy Partnership, where we're working with partners across South Yorkshire. And hopefully you can start to see how it fits together, so the day-to-day -day activity leads to the growth that we're trying to achieve through, uh, through those plans. Um, but the most important thing is the stuff on the right. So it's all about why we're doing it. We want more local businesses. We want successful businesses. We want visitors to be booking those restaurants, to be stopping for a coffee that's the most important thing for us we want to attract more visitors to come and say what a great place Sheffield is and then go away and tell other people and we want to really deliver for the events and conferences that are here to maximize them and make the most of them when they're here in the city um, so it's quite simplistic that diagram but hopefully it just shows kind of how all the plans that we've been talking to you about for some time and, and are going to talk about a, a lot more kind of fit in with the with the day-to-day -day work thank you thanks so that's the presentation for today. Really happy to take any questions on any of that. It might inspire some other items that we bring, but hopefully it gives you a bit of an overview of all of the maybe boring decisions that come your way sometimes from a technical perspective, but actually it's feeding into something that was really showcasing the city. Thank you, Diana. None of our decisions are boring. Um, before I open it out to questions, I just there was one thing that really struck me in, in that was that... Um, <clears throat> You know, I'm, I'm not particularly social media savvy, but it was that bit where you said about the thousands of people whose jobs this kind of activity supports, and, you know, 13,500. And for me, that's one of the core reasons why this is really important and, and why, you know, you're doing a great job. So, um, any questions? Um, I'll, I'll go Henry then Barbara, and then if anybody, and then Minesh. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, three questions, well, two questions and a comment. Do you want them all at once or one at a time? Okay, uh, the comment, great to see that climbing at the sky edge is coming back on the uh, table. I know a lot of people are really looking forward to that. Um, first question, um, one of the slides was how Dermot men mentioned the Outdoor City, which has been a really, really strong branding campaign for Sheffield. But as previously discussed, it speaks very strongly to one group of people um, and doesn't speak to other people. Are we keeping that sub-brand running? And have we got other sub-brands that are coming in under Sheffield in the same way the Outdoor City is being run to address the gaps? Do you want to take that? I don't know. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, do you want to start? Yeah. Well, you start, you were involved in it from the start, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I agree, it's great to see Climbing at the Sky's Edge back, so we've been really excited about that. And that does typify some of the outdoor city type of activity that we're doing. I think what we've found with um, how we created that, it was specifically to try and start to market the city um, as a city break in Europe, and we had some specific money to do that. And it has got, our, got us noticed. But what we understand now is that it's not just a one thing why people are coming to Sheffield. It's actually a mix of everything. So the cultural offer that we've got here, kind of the foodie spots that was kind of quoted in the, um, the, the paper, they are, it's like a, a mixed experience of coming to Sheffield, of which the outdoor is one kind of element of that. So I think there's two things. One is softening the outdoor city to not just be about elite sports, and I think we are effectively doing that now. The content that we're producing is much more mixed, uh, not just about kind of high octane kind of stuff, but walking in the Peak District, um, the green space in Sheffield. So it's broadening what we mean by the outdoor city, but also seeing that as a mix of other brands. So before we had our favourite places, that still exists, and one of the things that we use to kind of pull out all the cultural work that we're doing. But the major brand, whatever we talk about, is always around Sheffield and Sheffield makes. Um, so we're using the outdoor city for specific things going forward. And we're going to be leading much more with Sheffield and some of the mixed cultural city breaks type of language rather than just with the outdoor city for that point. So in the destination management plan, which is the next item, you'll see some of that articulated. Did you want to add anything? 
Barbara. Great, thank you. Congratulations. Your enthusiasm is so blooming infectious. I feel like sort of saying, yeah, get in there, you know. Um, now, uh, this is the confession. I am useless at IT. I have not got that search engine mind. I have tried to find you um, because I'm looking for an event and you are never the first choice. It's always TripAdvisor or somebody else. So what can I feed into the search so that you automatically come up and I can see exactly what is going on? Because I, I know you've got a lot of hits, but it took me half an hour to locate your particular, you know, yeah, the particular web page, and that was a lot of frustration. So I, I'm not alone in that, I know that. I just have to confess to it. Thank you. So when you see TripAdvisor and those kind of things, they pay. Yeah. So you get the adverts first, always. But we should come up, and we do come up on page one, page two in most searches. So if you were putting in Welcome to Sheffield, Events in Sheffield, City Break in Sheffield, you should see us um, on those first pages. And um, one of the reasons why we work really hard on changing the content on the website quite regularly is to ensure that we, we do, do get that. So I suppose it would be really useful to, to understand which terms you were putting into that Google search, and then we can just double check. I actually put in events in Sheffield, and I, I think sort of, you know, you, you, towards the bottom it gets, for the, uh, you may also look at. Yeah. And clicking a load of those, yeah, you will um, get. I eventually found you, yeah. but it didn't come up. And I used Bing. Well, I used Bing for this time because I thought I was used to it. Okay. And I'm thinking I should have, I should have used another search yeah. engine. So what we need to do then is we just need to. We'll, we'll, I can't give you an answer without actually going and doing that myself and seeing where seeing where they are. But you will get six or seven paid for. Um, you'll get to advisor. You'll get the hotel that's got the biggest budget at the moment, you know, if you put stay in Sheffield, that kind of thing. So, but um, Barbara, I'll go, we'll go back and check that and we'll come back with a, a, full, a full answer on that. Um, because if that is the case, then we need to quickly tweak something to rectify that. Curtis has just had a go. Just Google welcome to Sheffield and that will take you to our website. I've just Googled um, events in Sheffield, but on Google, and it does come up as the first thing, all events. So it might be the search engine that you're using as well, but perhaps that's something for us to check out. Yeah. Thanks for that, Minish. Thanks, Chair, and thanks. Really, always just really exciting to see everything that's going on. Um, I feel like it would be remiss as well to not mention the Marketing Sheffield's recent award at the Chamber of Commerce as well. I think that probably deserves a round of applause from all of us for the Spirit of Sheffield Award, was specifically for your team. Um, I think, you know, we're going to make numerous comments throughout this agenda item on how great this work is because it's a very well-planned agenda. There's a lot of cohesion between all three items, but yeah, just wanted to give thanks and congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you. Brian? Yeah, a couple of questions and also an observation that um, on a small team, you're doing really well. Um, I can understand you're really tiny as a team. Um, and talking to people like uh, Neil Anderson and other people who've been involved in marketing in Sheffield for the last 40, 50 years, you know, they used to have a huge team and uh, do lots and lots of things and you're doing very well. Um, so my, my question is about this term, market segmentation. It used to be a massive thing. Um, and it sounds like you're moving away from that, in a sense, by marketing as city breaks. So market segmentation used to be about, so I understand, about breaking into different specific markets of people. So people might be interested in coming for the football, they might be interested in coming to theatre, uh, they might come for the industrial heritage, um, they may be coming to visit their children who are students. Um, is it about that, or is it something broader? that you're talking about, when you're talking about city breaks. That's question number one. And if I give you question number two, again, what I've been given to understand over the years is that Sheffield does very well on its weekend breaks. How are you going to break into that market that's to do with midweek? Uh, do you have a plan for that? Um, this may emerge as we go on later. I'll take that first question and um, we can um, pick up on, on question number two, if that's all right. Um, I think, so market segmentation is 
in the back of our minds all the time. It hasn't gone. It's, it hasn't gone away. And city breaks is a very generic term in that. So within what we within our campaigns, we are looking at that market segmentation by demographic, by interest, by age, and by experience. So what will hook various people in? Think about it as as a kind of a the the cake. All of those all of those segments are of the market are slices of the cake. The more segments we can break into, the bigger the cake gets, and the more value we bring in by by what we're doing. Certainly, they're still there, and we're probably using different terminology, but they're absolutely still there. Um, yeah. So on um, on weekend versus um, midweek. So. I do a lot of work with the Hoteliers Association, so I kind of have a good feel for kind of what's coming in and what's not. And it is changing somewhat, but Sheffield is slightly different than most cities. It is very events-led. Um, so, yes, city breaks do um, do generally tend to come um, at, uh, you know, at the weekends. That's obviously um, when people travel. But that's why the mix of the, visit the types of visitors that we're bringing in is so important, because conferences happen during the week. Um, some of the major events that we work on happen across weekends and into the week. So um, if you talk to a hotelier, they'll tell you, you know, that Fridays and Saturdays, they have a lot of, you know, they have a lot of leisure travel, but they'll tell you on like on Tuesdays, for example, is their busy day for, for, for kind of corporates and people traveling and then they kind of bulk it up with um, residential conferences or, or that kind of stuff or kind of, you know, independent corporate travel. So it's a mix of those things. And that's why it's really important that we don't just look at city breaks that we have to look at it in the round so it's really important that we're bidding for conferences it's really important that when we look at the makeup of our events we also look at when they when they land so it would be lovely and every hotelier says to me can you not just move that event to, to next week please because uh, you know we'd rather have it in this month and you can't do that because obviously events are dictated by their kind of calendar so um but it's really important that you get that mix but don't forget that the power sometimes of marketing the city break and, and all of the lovely, exciting things that are going on in Sheffield and its culture and its heritage. People see that. They might not then choose to come for a city break because not everyone we're reaching will choose to come for a city break, but Sheffield will be at the forefront of their mind. And the most important thing is getting Sheffield on lists. So if you're a conference organiser and you've seen on Instagram the city break stuff, you might think, oh, I've not really thought about having Sheffield. So maybe when I'm looking at Manchester and Leeds, actually, I'll go and have a look what Sheffield's got as well. So it's all about list building. It's all very, that's why it's actually not as not as segmented as it used to be, I think, because it's a lot more fluid in terms of what people are seeing through social media, you know, and if Instagram's your go-to, you'll see lots of different content that might not be directed at what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, but it might influence your job role or, or another reason why you come to Sheffield. Does that make sense? Fabulous. Thanks, Emma. I'm, I'm mindful that we begin to touch on one or two things that might be coming up in, in other parts of the agenda. So I'm going to go to Curtis and then Terry, and then we'll move on to the next item, if that's okay. Curtis. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's just a comment, really, to say I think this is amazing because, like, 80% of marketing is awareness, really, and you're, you're finding people's problems and using that as an excuse to get into it on their eyeballs, aren't you? You just say, Sheffield can solve your problems. And I think uh, it's a great way of doing it because demographics come secondary to what problems you're solving, and we're leaning into what Sheffield does great. Um, secondly, the climbing of the sky's edge. I think the, the, as the chair of a committee, Martin should volunteer to climb. <laughs> I was going to ask it. if we had any volunteers, actually. <laughs> Is that a formal proposal? Yeah. Uh, it might be out of order. We'll, we'll cover that later on. Thank you for giving me advance notice of that one. Terry. <laughs> <laughs> Th thanks, Jen. First of all, thanks for the presentation. Brilliant presentation. The, the one thing I was missing from there is a Sheffield there, but how many from the city actually come into the city to these events? I find that when I talk to people, they are um, not as well informed sometimes as people outside the city about what we're actually offering around the city and in the city events. So I'd like to know what barriers you see for certainly some parts of this city not being able to um, enjoy or, or be aware and, and taking uh, Curtis's point about awareness, how do we make sure that all Sheffielders are aware of what's going on in our city? I mean, 600,000 roughly captured audience, so to see the millions on there, I'd love to know 
um, out and if we actually collate how many figures from in the city and actually using the, the city centre and, and what that would look like. I don't want to strain to other parts, but I do know that after 5 p.m. or something like that, it, it's, it, you know, unless you're going to the, to, um, the, the theatre or up other side of the, 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 the city centre, th there's not that kind of pull for, 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 for local people. So I'd just like to know what you understand as the barriers are there and how we can get over that. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I'll start and then I'll, I'll bring in Emma if there's anything else, really. Um, I suppose just to um, reassure you that we do do a lot in that space. So we work with Central Comms, the City Council team. They have a really effective newsletter that goes out and often we have event specials in there or we put our events into there. So we do use that a lot and we do use social media and we know that a lot of local audiences are tapping into that. Um, there is also, in addition to some of the major events that we do, community events program, um, which the events team that sits in um, neighbourhoods department, it's only seven people and they are fantastic in terms of what they do. Gary's here actually. Um, <coughs> but that does serve a local population in the main. And um, we've been doing more around local events through the Economic Recovery Fund as well to make sure actually some of the events are taking place in the localities, not always in the city centre or in, in big places across the city. So uh, it is important to us and we are looking at how to do that. I think you can always do more um, and getting people to understand what's, ha what's out there is a critical thing. Um, a lot of what we do is online. So I don't know if that's something that we might have to look at in terms of how we can inform other people without relying on an e-solution to that. Um, sometimes we do work with some magazines and do kind of uh, advertising, but this cost to that. Um, so what we could do actually is start to use you as um, key people in your localities. So um, we can make sure that you've got the overarching events program and if we're doing anything, we can utilize you as advocates in your area. So if, there's, if you've got any ideas, be welcome to hear them. It is a priority for us and we do work on it um, quite a lot, but happy to try and do more to get into those places if helpful. So thank you very much, some really good questions, great presentation. Um, there's no specific recommendation other than, I think, to note, and thank you very much for the really illuminating um, presentation. There is, however, a link to the next item, which is destination management plan. So I think, Diana, you're leading on that. Um, just giving an introduction, and then Emma and Wendy are gonna take this one, and I'm gonna do the events one. Um, so yeah, this connects in, as you can see, that jigsaw puzzle on the back. You've seen a draft of this already, and we've done some workshops with you guys. So I'm hoping today that you feel comfortable where we're at on the destination management plan um, and able to move forward. I think it will give us a really good blueprint going forward for where we bid for money, um, where we're looking for partnerships, where we want to be more proactive. Um, so yeah, thank you. Do you want to just go through the report briefly, Emma? Thank you. Thanks, Di. So um, I feel like I've said this quite a lot, but I will recap um, for you just to, to, to remind you. So the DMP report, the Destination Management Plan, is to ask the committee to adopt um, the plan as the official framework to continue to grow the visitor economy and improve, improve our perceptions of place. So the DMP is a shared plan to manage a destination over a period of time, which articulates the roles of stakeholders and has some clear objectives. And it involves planning, development, and marketing of a destination, as well as how it's managed physically. So we know that the visitor economy is, economy is hugely important in Sheffield. We've just talked about that, and it's at a critical point in its development after a period of enormous change with kind of Brexit and the pandemic. And we know, as Wendy said in the presentation, we're emerging very strongly from this um, with the figures that we see from STEAM. Um, the proposal for the DMP has had um, extensive consultation um, with more than 50 key um, organisations across the, uh, the private sector, and we've had two specific sessions with the um, EDS committee, which have been really, uh, really good for us. Um, so thank you for that. Um, but it's also, it also has, um, it has two primary aims, sorry, to use the visitor economy to continue to develop Sheffield's brand and image and enhance our appeal to a range of audiences and to drive overnight business into our city. But it's also important to draw everyone's attention again to the underlying, the underlying aim of enhancing the quality of life and social value of the visitor economy for the residents um, and also the businesses of Sheffield. It has five objectives, which I'm sure you're familiar with now, to diversify and strengthen our events programme, to grow our conference market, to develop our city breaks offer, to develop a world-class competitive product, and to manage our visitor economy effectively. So why should committee adopt this? Having a framework will allow us to develop strategic partnerships and continue growth in this 
area. It will help inform future decisions which might be directly relevant to the visitor economy or impact them both in the short and, uh, and the longer term. And it will allow Marcus and Sheffield to retrospectively meet our criteria for the LVEP accreditation and with Visit England and ensure we have a strong and agreed plan to feed into our South Yorkshire work and um, the overarching South Yorkshire destination management plan. It'll act as a springboard to start increased stakeholder engagement in our plans and as we talked about the jigsaw, it will inform other key strategies, e.g. our events plan, which we're about to talk about, and our culture strategy, um, and all of the other um, plans that um, have the visitor economy at their heart. Thank you very much. Short three. Um, questions? Um, we'll go Laura, then Barbara. Thank you. I really enjoyed reading this, probably because I'm sad, but uh, and the econometrics in it are really interesting. Um, just a couple of questions. The shoulder months you talk about, which is really where there's downtime. So I think that's January to March, roughly, in the, in the graphs. Um, is it worth looking what events, I'm sure you're doing this, what events, conferences take place around that time? so that we can boost particularly hotel occupancy then and hospitality which um, is basically dead after the new year until March um, and then I know the STEAM uh, metrics are for 2022 I'm just wondering how we can project forward to the heart of the city developments particularly around Leah's yard and everything and possibly Castle Gate um, and particularly looking at the economic impact and the, the uh, FTEs and how that might project. Just to tie it all together into what a destination management plan would look like in 2024, 2025. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take that question first and then I'll hand over to you for the other one if that's all right. Um, it's a really good question and actually um, quite exciting timing because last night, was it last night or the night before, yeah, we got together with the hospitality businesses in, in the city and we heard from um, Heart of the City team, from Matt Bigland and from James O'Hara and from Sheffield Cathedral about what they're doing and what's coming on stream in the next year and I certainly think we're going to see an increase in that trajectory. Um, at the moment, as Emma said, everything is quite event and conference driven. I think once we get to the other side of Heart of the City, there's going to be an offer in itself as the city. So we might see more of those um, city breaks extending, staying, do more um, outside of an event or outside of a conference. So that's where we're doing some of our advertising now. In terms of putting some figures on that, it's quite difficult to make it up. <laughs> so, so we could do some... Um, yeah, we do. Yeah. So we could do some kind of scenarios. I think would probably be the best way to look at to kind of say, okay, so if this happens, what would happen? If this happens, that would happen. Um, there are, as you probably know, Oxford Economics, other people like that, that do some of these um, models around hospitality. Um, so we can look to do kind of some of that. But certainly the destination management plan and the way that we are now starting to engage with the hospitality sector has that in mind. So last night was the first one of these hospitality socials that we're starting to do, and that is us post-COVID, kind of on the look forward, trying to get our hospitality businesses to get to know each other, to get to know what's happening in the set in the city, to get excited about what we can do in the future together. Um, kind of whether that's co-commissioning and, and kind of pooling um, money and resources or them holding events or them knowing about everything else that's in the city so they can sell it collectively. So um, it's certainly an exciting time in the next few um, months. I will take away having a look at if there's anything can we do on measuring it. Being perfectly honest, Sheldon, it's a little bit tricky um, because when you're looking at events and conferences, um, they tend to have to be when they want to be. So it's a, it, when you target an event or a conference, you're looking at what the benefit is for the city more generally. So you might be looking at a research conference, you want to pull in something on advanced manufacturing because it's really good for the city and it can help us with investment. It's Obviously, that will take place when that takes place. So there's a certain amount of stuff that we do, we do on that. So if we can spot something where we know there's a gap in the calendar, then obviously we, we will work really hard on that. And we do that for events as well. And that actually might be something that we can, we can talk about when we talk about events. So if there are kind of big things that potentially 
um, are available for us to bid for, or we've had an approach for those months. Um, yeah, we can, we can look at doing that. It's a, it's a bit of a double-edged sword as well, because obviously sometimes when you bring events in in the downtime, the businesses aren't open. So we've had this before. Sometimes when we bring things in on a Sunday, and we've had to actually talk to businesses about opening so that and they're available for delegates. So it is a... It's not easy, but it is definitely something that we have identified in the destination management plan, and we will look at some strategies to do that in a, in a more purposeful way. Um, yeah, but it's not an easy one to solve, really, though. Mm -hmm. So we've got uh, Barbara, then Brian, Mary, then me. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I mean, sort of, uh, you've actually sort of addressed some of my queries already because I was very concerned. There was very little mention of heritage and the football, home of football, within the document. And I went through highlighting every place where I thought, hang on a minute, heritage should be outlined here. So from what you mentioned earlier, you are having discussions, they are involved, it's just not mentioned. So is it possible to actually give them a more prominent mention in here? Um, and you, you've touched on the football as well, so I'm assuming that you're also working with a group that's trying to bring football home type of thing, you know. And again, that's not really mentioned. Now, I was going to ask about the event last night because I've looked at the stakeholders who you involved originally, but I can never find the documents. Consultees. Um, you've mentioned... So, um, now, how many people, new businesses, were attracted to that event last night? Because I'm assuming this is referenced as one of the networking events that you were going to hold. And I was going to ask you what it meant, but I presume this is it. So, did it attract a lot of interest? And I've got a few other questions. What let other people sort of, um, you know, come to them later? Um, so we had almost 70 um, businesses, organisations registered for last night. We had a few people who didn't turn up, possibly because it started to rain. Um, and I think we invited, well, we invited everybody that we, we know about. So we invited a good few hundred um, contacts and hospitality businesses. Um, and obviously it's the first of what we hope will be many events. Um, but we're really keen to kind of, broaden our, our networks and our databases so if there's a way that we, we can do that but there was definitely um, a really good cross-section of businesses we had some hotels and venues we had um, a lot of different theatre companies didn't we? we had a lot of people from the cultural sector but we also had some small businesses and some hospitality businesses albeit city centre focused but the subject matter that we were talking about was uh, was city centre so we're going to work really hard to kind of to build that and I mean our aspiration is that we have a couple of hundred people there all kind of networking and getting to know each other um, from the small businesses right up to the large organisations in the future. And if I can just pick up on that, um, measuring success is difficult, isn't it? But in the, in, in kind of the case of last night, um, the DC Outdoors who run the stand-up paddle boarding courses and some outdoor activities matched up with Steel, Steel City Cycle Tours who, and the, um, Marcus Newton, who runs the private um, walking tours around the city, they're already, they left with diaries open, talking about getting together and collaborating to see how they can create a, a bigger package and a more an extended experience. So it's that kind of, of, of um, enablement that we want to facilitate there. And we can't do it all, but actually they, they, I think everybody there, and a couple of smaller hotels who don't normally participate particularly and engage very well with their and actually found it very very useful so um first step into into um what will be a, a, a long pattern i hope uh, that is good and thank you and the other thing is sort of uh, is it possible to feature heritage a little bit more prominently somehow in in the document i mean is that a reasonable request i was just going to come in on that as well and just have one more quick comment on the private sector engagement Part of what we're kind of try and do over the longer term as part of the LVEP is have a stronger sense of private sector leadership when it comes to destination, tourism and hospitality. So these socials are a way about bringing people together, but ultimately we want to draw out of that private sector group that works with us, alongside us on the LVEP and talks about, looks about how we do things differently, bigger and more ambitiously going forward. So um, there, is a, there is a kind of a pathway um, to some of that as well. And in terms of, of heritage, we are working with the Heritage Partnership. This document is very much the what, not necessarily the how. And I think some of the 
the heritage elements are probably in the how. So um, we have made some efforts already to acknowledge heritage where it could be. We can do that a little bit further, um, I think. I don't want to shoehorn things in where they're not needed. Um, but we are absolutely in the culture strategy in this and in the work we're doing with heritage, seeing them as kind of a joined up package and how they can kind of support and be symbiotic to each other. So I think you'll see more of that coming out in terms of the how as what we do on the back of this blueprint. Thank you. We'll go to um, Brian, Inesh, after that. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the report. It's good to see that there's climate implications being dealt with, 4.4, uh, in particular looking at active transport and uh, creating more sustainable ways of arriving in the city. We also need our internal systems sorted out as well, of course, well beyond your remit. Um, two concerns that I have, I, um, um, one I raised the, at the briefing, but firstly, um, is there a stakeholder group that will be pulled together for this? I couldn't quite spot it within the documents, because relationships are a really key element to how we're going to go forward, and in particular capacity building uh, to help support your small team. Um, so stakeholder group and making sure in my terms that this isn't just a private sector group you also need key public bodies involved as well and volunteer organizations which there's some really key ones key large ones second uh, so so if i can have some reassurance on that i can see people nodding um the second element is uh uh, as we've already heard and which I mentioned at the briefing, heritage comes up as a term. It's almost like a buzzword within the document, but it's not fundamental to the way that we look at our identity within the document. Sheffield's identities are to do with its heritage of very multiple versions. So where is heritage going to be within the framework going forward? Um, how are we going to engage with heritage organisations? Um, I've had some reassurance, but I'd like some more, please. Um, I'll do that first. Feel free to come in. In terms of a, a stakeholder group, the answer is yes. As part of the LVET work, we want a Sheffield group. We've done that before. We're, we've got quite well networked with, with stakeholders. I think where we felt the gap was was the private sector, which is what I was alluding to. But yes, there will be a stakeholder group that we'll bring together. Um, on the second one, on heritage, I don't think it is just about the destination management plan. I think it's viewing the joined up heritage strategy, the culture strategy, and this alongside each other, because they've got nuance in, as individual areas. So we need to keep that nuance and the breadth of it in the heritage strategy, but make sure that the three are aligned. Now, unfortunately, We've got the DMP first, then the culture strategy, and then we've, we've got the joined up heritage strategy already. But if we iterate that, there's more to do. So I, th I think some of this is, will be iterative as it goes along. I, we're doing the culture strategy now, so we're embedding heritage at this point. The DMP kicked off a bit earlier, um, and so I think there'd be some iterating back into that document from the heritage strategy and from the culture strategy to make sure they talk to each other. It's very difficult to try and do everything all at once with such a small team. So there is a, a bit of kind of working back into some of those documents. Um, so I don't know whether that fully answers your question. I, I don't think what I'm saying is um, heritage wholesale fits in the destination management plan. I don't think it does. I think it needs and deserves its own place. But the themes of that need to be pulled out into the culture strategy and into the destination management plan. I take the point today that that's perhaps not done enough in this document, so we will we'll work on that and take that recommendation away. Um, but we'll also make sure that they're involved as part of the stakeholders going forward. Does that feel okay, Brian? Uh, the point I'm, I wanted to make is that, you know, within the list of consultees, there are no heritage organisations at all. There's lots of people being, being consulted, but there's, there's none in there. And, and, you know, for me, the really key one is Joint Heritage Sheffield, who represent a lot of others. Yeah. We are doing that now. Um, yeah. Thank you, Manesh. I think um, you're next, and then I'll go. Thanks, Chair, and thanks again. I guess just a general comment with a question at the end. Really pleased to be able to support the proposal. I think, you know, in sheer numbers, 
that, a figure of 1.35 billion being brought into the economy, more than 15 million visitors, sustaining thousands of jobs is huge. It's also really impressive that we're almost back at our 2019 levels, you know, despite COVID, despite the rise, rising cost of energies. I think it really shows the value of the visitor economy work, work of Mark King Sheffield and the, the city events team. And I guess just for the committee, I think as we're nearing our budget setting process, it's worth us as a committee remembering how important this work is. You know, this channels investment into our city. It math delivers a massively disproportionate return for the level of investment we've put in. The vibrancy around our city centre, our visitor economy, that level of investment is clear evidence that the city is on the up. You know, as was said in the last presentation, the purpose of this work is all about bolstering local businesses and creating local jobs. That's really important. The only question I'd add is, what are the ways we can look to lock in an even higher proportion of that spend into our local economy, into different types of businesses? And as others have said, there are aspects we can look to in future about how this can dovetail with the culture strategy as we develop it. Specifically, you know, I'd like to see how this can work to grow the size of our culture sector, create even more high value jobs in that industry and other industries that we proactively want to support as well. But yeah, really happy to see this work come to fruition. Do you want to come back on that? Or? And just one comment really around maximising the local impact. Um, and I think it's more than that as well. It's around sustainability and diversity. There are a number of cross-cutting themes that as we go into procurement and commissioning going forward are going to be really important. Social value and local impact, sustainability and diversity and inclusion are really important across the piece as we're doing that. So we're more and more bearing that in mind as we're doing commissioning. So it's certainly on our radar. I might just be worth saying something about supply chain businesses as well. Obviously, um, a lot of the visitors that we come in use the traditional businesses, so we might use a restaurant or a coffee shop or something, but there is um, a real demand now for local supply chain businesses for events and um, conferences and things like that. So so when a, an, a corporate event organiser, for example, will come into the city, they will want to use people who are local. Um, it reduces carbon footprint, travel miles, all that kind of stuff. It's great. You know, they, they, they do it as well so that they can be showcasing what they're doing. They want examples of really good businesses that are doing some really good things from a, from a social value perspective and, and, and from a sustainability perspective. So I think one of the things that we're trying to do, and we can probably do a bit more, is actually kind of look at that supply chain and, and make sure we're trying to develop that as well because there are some pockets of types of businesses that Sheffield doesn't have as many of as some cities. So we know that organisers are still kind of pulling them in from outside of the cities. So that is something that we're looking at around kind of some of the sustainability work that we're doing. We'll go ahead with then, Terry. Thanks. Um, once again, you know, fantastic work that you're doing here. Um, one thing you mentioned in the document is the two-way relationship between our strategies and the local visitor economy. You've laid out in some great detail how our strategies affect the visitor economy. In terms of how the other direction of that relationship works um, and what we get back out of the huge amount of money that we're clearly bringing into the city, um, are we going to be looking at a tourist tax or a levy on accommodation, call it what you will, that's been adopted by other cities. Can you confirm that that's going to be part of the next stage? Because it would be fantastic to be able to make this more sustainable going forward, especially in the light of cuts after cuts after cuts. Thank you, and that is brought up in the DMP. Um, I think we're looking at a range of different vehicles, to be honest, and we need to work with and take the hospitality sector with us on that. Um, so there are a number of different um, vehicles or models that we could use, but we're actively getting into that space. And I think us working more closely with the private sector is the start of that. Um, those things need to be supported and driven and led by them as well. So by getting them to work with us to understand this, we're actually definitely on that journey, yeah. We have um, also going to be looking at if we applied the models that we've seen elsewhere, so Liverpool and Manchester, what that would mean in terms of an income for us. So we're definitely in that section of bringing in more commercial income, um, but there are a number of different ways to do it. Thanks. That's fine. <laughs> Thanks for that, Diana. Um, Terry, you had a question? No, no, sorry, Chair, just a point of clarification, notification. Um, Sheffield Home of Football, Denise is chair of that, so I, Reluctant, I should have declared an interest uh, in that item in paper. That's all, Chair. Thanks. Um, yeah, 
I mean, we're all interested in that, let's be honest. Yeah. Anybody in Sheffield should really declare an interest in that. But yeah, thanks for that. Barbie, is it another quick question? Uh, yes, I think it, it's just a concern of mine, thank you. I mean, uh, a lot, your action areas, they involve some locations over which we have no control. Like, and you've mentioned Graves Gallery, and we know that that's an issue because I keep on raising it in full, well, have in full council. Uh, you've mentioned the National Video Games Museum, and we know there's issues with that building now. You mentioned the sports facilities. And so, basically, you are very dependent on others supporting you within the council, even. So, I mean, I'm assuming the will's there, but is the way there? I mean, I've worked in tourism for a long time. Both of Wendy have worked for the council for a very long time. We've never really had control over our products. Um, it's one of the things that makes it quite exciting as a job. Um, in that, you know, um, but it's about relationships and it's about using data and enthusiasm and what we see in other areas that works well to take people along on a certain journey. And there will always be there will always be bumps in the road. And you guys probably know a bit more about those bumps than, than perhaps I do, but. I don't think we see that as a barrier to being able to achieve that success because it's a, about kind of looking at that long-term journey and, and, and corralling people and finding a, a way through to, to, to still get, the, you know, get to that end point, really. Um, because realistically, you know, we don't control any of our restaurants. We, 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 we don't really control any of the product. We don't control the hotels and that kind of stuff. So it's, that, that's not a new thing to us. That's just something that is kind of part of, part of the day job. I don't know if I mean, the only thing I'll add to that really is that this is how seven people can be so powerful and it's all through collaboration and partnership and that takes a lot of relationship management. A lot of what we do is externally focused. We earn people's trust. We work with them on a regular basis. We understand what they need to get out of things. So yeah, it's a lot of influence and relationships rather than direct control. Um, so there are areas where it's risky, and you've named, I think, those. They're on our agenda, and we do need to work on that across the council. Um, but again, I think that's one of the things I love about this job the most, is that we're engaging with the whole of the city, with its stakeholders, with its businesses. Um, and that's what makes a team that's so small but so powerful. Thank you. And it, it touches on a, a final comment from me, which is something I, I was very pleased to see, this creation of the Vista Economy Board to get a greater partnership between the council and the private sector. Um, as far as I can see, that's going to do two things. It's going to help us drive an even better um, program for our destination management, but also it will help us maximise the economic benefit from the program of, of events that we've already got. So not a question, just a, a supportive comment. So, if there are no other questions, colleagues, we do have a recommendation in front of us, um, and that is that the Economic Development and Skills Committee adopts the Destination Management Plan for Sheffield, to be led by Marketing Sheffield, as the framework to inform decisions within the lifetime of the DMP around the visitor economy and those that may impact on the visitor economy. So... Is that something we can all agree on? I'm, yeah, I'm, lots of nods, lots of hands, so that's carried unanimously. And thank you very much for that presentation. Um, we do, as we said earlier on, we do have a, a, a common theme for this meeting. Um, I love it when a plan works. Um, we now have the, we move on to the city major events plan which is another core plank of uh, what we've been discussing so i think that's um diana and gary hi gary yeah brilliant do you want to introduce everybody knows you gary but introduce yourself for the people watching at home <laughs> hi everybody at home um i'm gary clifton service manager for major events for sheffield yeah thank you um, so this report is giving you an overview of the current events programme and why we feel events are so important um, to everything we've been discussing so far, but certainly to our local economy and to um, how we're seen as a place. It talks about some of the um, 
issues of how we're doing things currently, as well as some of the benefits of that. And it makes a recommendation that we put together a new major development, major events plan. Um, so I'll just take you through a few of the highlights of the report. Um, we've got a, a year-round programme of strategic events that cater for a lot of different audiences. Um, collectively, using our impact tool, we've shown that that's worth over £25 million. Um, we've talked about the conference market and the visitor economy, so I won't go through those figures again. But there are a number of key th reasons why events are so powerful, not only for their economic impact and bringing in visitors and footfall, but for brand and reputation. They really are the lifeblood of our hospitality sector and nighttime economy, as we've been talking about today already and they help us deliver on some of our strategic plans that we've got in place. I think importantly as well, they do give pride of place. A lot of the events that we have, particularly the community events program, feel owned and um, actually have been created by the city for the city. So there's a lot of pride in terms of some of the events that we hold and it shows our identity. In terms of the current approach to events, the paper just goes through this. It is quite a reactive and opportunistic um, events programme that we run. Some of that is because the team is small. Gary's team, who are involved in every event that you will see going on in the city, if they're not running it, they'll be making sure it's um, safe, at the very least. A lot of them, the team run themselves, but it's seven people. So I think when you're seeing some of these huge events that we're putting on, it's seven people at the core behind that. Obviously, we bring in people and volunteers as needed, but that's the core of the team. Um, we also have varied budgets, um, which often we're kind of being creative, I would say. So we have a major events budget, which is talked about in the paper. We have a community events budget and team, which sits with Gary. And then we essentially save up for some of the big events that we have, trying to keep back some of the income from the town hall events, like the weddings and things like that. And about 50,000 a year, we try and save that up to be able to do the big events like the Euros. So it feels very much um, a, a fragmented approach at times to us as the team running it. To the outside world, I think it looks fantastic. I don't think they can see some of the cracks that perhaps we can. So we want to bring this report today to kind of share how important this is to what we're doing for the city, but also raise that it is under pressure and that there is more we can do. So we think if we can turn this into a much more of a proactive plan with some core principles, with more clarity around funding and what we want to do and where, we can be much more powerful in the event space. There are certainly opportunities that we're not taking um, and races that we're not in to try and win and bid events. There are also events that we could be creating. So sporting events you often bid for, cultural events you curate, you curate yourself. And there's a lot more that we can do in that space, which I think will come out of the culture strategy. But often that needs seed funding. Um, I do think there is more we can do to maximize the investment that we put into events. So looking at other models like um, shared profit or loans to support events or doing longer term relationships with events where we maybe subsidize them in the first year and move to a, a position where we're having a profit share at the end of it because often it's the first two or three years of an event that's trying to establish itself that are really vulnerable but actually it's got massive commercial value in the long run we give some examples of that tram lines being one um, i think so this report is really setting out for you guys where we think we can do more and we want to work with you to set out a stronger policy I uh, will just draw your attention to page 98 and 1.5, where we've set out some interim principles for, these are things we do anyway, but setting them out for you in more of a policy terms and how we choose and uh, how we decide which events to support. And that's by looking at economic value, by looking at brand and reputation, community benefits, inclusion and diversity, and whether it supports key strategies within the council. And I just wanted to make the point that sometimes you will do an event because it's the best thing to do for the community, and that is okay. You don't need to tick all five of these. It's always going to be um, awaited in a certain areas. Others are really powerful for economic impact, like British Swimming, fills the hotels in those midweek periods. Other things are good for brand and reputation, like standing at the sky's edge, climbing at the sky's edge. So um, 
it's a mixed kind of way of looking at some of this. So I just wanted to highlight that to you. That's something we want to build on and make much clearer in um, the plan that we develop over the coming months. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. So the recommendations are that you note the current events programme and the importance for the city, that you note that interim position of how events are done at the moment and that um, interim way we want to decide how we fund events whilst we're doing and developing a new um, events plan and, uh, and approve us to go and do that in the next few months. Thank you. Gary, did you want to add anything at that point? No. Um, if there's any questions on specific Thank events, Gary will sort it. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that, guys. Um, it, before I go to questions, it does prompt a, a memory when I first got this role. I asked Gary for a printout of a list of events that the team were involved in. And when I got to the bottom of page six and it was in very small print, I thought, okay, fair enough, there's a lot on there. Um, so I've got Curtis and then Terry. Thank you, Chair, and uh, you'll probably be unsurprised to hear that I'm going to talk about Pride. <laughs> so I think I'm right in saying that Sheffield is the only core city and probably one of the only cities in the country that doesn't currently have a Pride event. And as a city that uh, prides itself on inclusivity, it, it kind of feels like we've dropped the ball a bit. Um, so I'm not asking this, for the town hall to do it because that's the wrong way round. It should be a community-led approach. So I think what I'd like to see in a plan is a sort of ladder of engagement for events because major events can't just happen overnight. Uh, we see with like the success of Notting Hill Carnival that just that started years and years ago um, and now it's one of the biggest events of its type in the country. So you mentioned lots of uh, sort of tools you have in your toolbox to support events. I think it would be really good to see um, sort of what is useful for smaller events and then medium events. And, and so we give people who want to start events a bit of a, uh, a road forward uh, because I've been approached by a few people saying, oh, I wouldn't mind helping organize a pride event. I just don't know where to start. So something some sort of evergreen content that can just help our smaller events grow into major events down the line would be really good to see. Uh, I don't disagree, uh, as you would imagine. Um, there, there is a plan to help small events. Um, and, and we do, I mean, we do many, many I mean, there's a, lot, there's a lot of events that aren't on that list, Martin, that you don't see. So we, we administer, deliver, help fund, uh, wholly create, um, oversee probably about 250 events over the year. Uh, and there's probably about 100, 150 of those that kind of sit under the radar in our parks, in our streets, um, in, some, in some of our sporting venues. Um, so we, we support them in, in lots and lots of ways. Um, there is a point where we can't continue to support them any further and I think that's what this paper kind of starts to talk about if, if, if I'm being honest um, so yeah we we have an events plan um, we've got a it's kind of an idiot's guide to an events plan uh, about how to organize an event the thing you need to consider about an event budgeting safety security marketing promotion ticketing all, all sorts of things so so we will always help any new event organiser or person with an event idea that, that wants to bring their event to life. Um, and we do that. Um, the reality of it was, with Pride being really candid, it was a funding issue for them. It, it didn't stack up for them financially. Um, I think that's what part of this paper for me starts to discuss and, and, and think about. Uh, Eurovision this year, uh, to a degree, was perhaps the start of a Pride event in Sheffield, in my opinion. We unashamedly um, gave a, a, a real slant towards the Ukrainian community, as, as we should have done. But we unashamedly also, I'm a big Eurovision fan, so we unashamedly gave a big slant to the LGBTQ plus community, because that is Eurovision. Um, and, we, we, and we had some really strong LGB communities in Sheffield, everybody talking about Jamie, all this type of stuff that we sits under the radar, part of the culture stuff that we kind of don't recognise. And that's where the partnerships and relationships come in. Uh, so we created an event, but again, that, that wasn't a cheap thing to do, but it was a phenomenally successful event. So yes, the support is there, 
it's how we help them keep it moving along, and that's resource, yeah. time, expertise, and, 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 and you look at tram lines, that started with three years of, of City Council funding 10, 15 years ago. It's now turned into what it's turned into, not without its problems, mm -hmm. I would add, because um, no event comes without its problems. Um, so so that, that information is there, it's, it's how we get those communities to tap into it. I'll just come in as well and just say I really liked your phrase around the ladder of support for events and I think that's something we can probably um, bring out because I think part of the issue is we might know all of this, certainly Gary knows everything, <laughs> but how much is how much is publicly available or when do, do people know that that support's available and is that a barrier? So I think that's really something worthwhile to take away and having some evergreen content I think is a great idea too. Um, I think part of what we're saying is we need to be clearer about what events we will support, how we'll support them, why and what. And that does feel a little bit um, vague, I think, to external people at the moment. Like I said, we've got these principles that we apply internally, but part of this is being much more clear externally about what those principles um, and what support is available. On Pride specifically, that is something I think the city really needs to work on, and I, I agree it needs to be a community-led approach. Um, I do, however, think that the council will need to have a role in those first few to get it running. And actually, I've been speaking to a few um, kind of potential commercial partners. So um, watch your space. Hopefully, we'll get somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Terry for the next question, uh, followed by Laura. Thank, thank, thanks, Chair. First, first of all, I'd just like to put on my record, on record that our thanks, really, to the team. A small team, a committed team, a team that actually have never failed to deliver, no matter what we've thrown down the wicket, really, to them. And we've been, Chairman, myself and you have been at a number of these events where, uh, last minute, and to see the amount of work that went into Eurovision was just phenomenal. Uh, and, and we just kind of fell short of the line. But we, nobody could fault out of it in, in any of, of that. There's a number of events I would love to see on in this city. But as members, we've got to make a decision. And this paper, uh, while I, I think it's really great to see that you've put it down in some sort of coordinated way, Gary, what actually you do in words is, is amazing. But I really do think, I mean, on the agenda today, we've got a budget discussion. But overall, this council has got a big decision to make with political um, elected members of about whether what do we really want to finance and what do we really want to put in. The team is a very small team. I don't expect officers to sit in and fight their corner in that respect. They'll do that in different forums. But for us, to see what the income generation, the feel-good events, the um, a number of events that we put on in Norfolk Park last year, just at Dropper and that was you know, fantastic it, for, for the communities around. So there's a number of big events I'd love to see, um, Pride being one of them. Um, that we, we've really got to have a big discussion and I suppose for this committee to make it um, um, way felt in those overall budget discussions, Chair. Um, the one thing I would say about the report is I don't think it comes off strong enough to me. I would like to see, and I, I understand why officers have written probably the way they have, but there is a direction of this that basically says we're at our limit, really, and we'll probably bowl something else at, at the team and the team will deliver it. But I'm getting from here is, 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 a, is a sense that we're at a limit and there's, we're at a crossroads and we've got to make a decision which way we go. Um, there's no real question in that, Chair. It's just a comment and putting on, on record the thanks, but also to a recognition, I think, that as members, we've got to have a big decision to make about which way we want to take this going, going forward and, 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 and also how we engage more with our community and the cohesion that we have around the city on some of these major, major events. And not be afraid, because that's what we are in Sheffield, aren't we? We, we? we don't sing our own praises loud enough sometimes to put on record, you know, that we did set some lines on its each, on each route, excuse the pun, but we, we did set it on its, on its way. And we have done on a number of events around the city. And there is a, a, a real kind of, opportunity but when we have a tourist information that is a little stand in the winter gardens i think it says it's all about where we put where we put it in 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 the great scheme of things i think we need to it's, it's good that the committee will 
take those views and I'm sure you'll fight your corner chair in those discussions about where, where the budget lands. Um, so there's no real question. I'd just like to have seen the report a little bit more firmly, really kind of forcing us into some decisions about the way forward on, on this. I don't expect officers to be able to, to answer that, but that's just a kind of a political overview. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Terry. I, I agree with that completely. Um, what's achieved at the moment, given the amount of funding, is, is truly remarkable. But as a committee and as a council, we have big decisions to make, uh, particularly against the current um, background of, of funding. Um, so although there wasn't a question in what Terry said, I, Diana and Gary, do you want to come back on any of that? Yeah, um, so I did just probably want to thank you for raising that and maybe acknowledge it a little bit further then. Um, take that as an invitation, Terry, I think. So um, there's three areas, I think. One is Gary's team. It is at its limit. Um, they continue to deliver, but... They have their events programme, but then in addition, each year we have huge major events and then there's you know, the football event and then this civic event and then this one. And actually, that is starting to become an issue. It is overspending in year um, and the staff themselves are stretched too thin. Um, I'll let Gary speak about that in a minute as well, but I do think that is worth noting. Um, there is also no event commissioning function at all. So on Eurovision, we brought together... A, a team from across the council departments. We wait till 2 a.m. every night for about three weeks to try and get something in. But we can't, other work suffers. So if we want to get into the space where we're playing in this league on a continual basis, we need to invest in event commissioning um, so we can really do that properly. And then finally, if you're going to bid for these events, they need some finance. Um, and we need to both think about how we can proactively put some money on the table for that, but also how we have some element of it that could be recyclable. Like I was saying, what are the models where you can invest in a, an event like Tramlines for the first few years and then it actually eventually it pays back into that pot. Um, but they are all taking a much bigger, ambitious look at how we do events. And the reason we didn't put it in this paper right now is we think we need some space to talk to you about this in more detail, to come up with some solutions. There are all issues at the moment. So we want to work on this over the next three months. But that's the heart of the question, how ambitious, how big do we want to be? Because if we carry on the way that we are at the moment, we will keep delivering, but we will stay the size that we are. Um, so, Gary, do you want to come in? Uh, thanks, Di. Uh, thank you, Terry. Uh, I am getting old, which is mad. Um, I think the thing for me is... As Terry will know, we've, and I spoke to Martin about it, we've been having this discussion for 30 years, is the truth of it. Um, Sheffield's greatest strength and its greatest weakness are its people. We, we, have, we struggle with our own aspirations and our own belief in ourselves. And that's what all this is about. I know it sounds a bit corny, but five, six years ago, myself and Wendy pitched the idea of bidding for the European Women's Football Championships. And to be really candid, we kind of got laughed out of a few rules. They weren't laughing last summer. There's a power outage of Morford building which is affecting our IT and Wi-Fi system. Yeah, we're going to have to go to Europe. So we did Women's Euros, and, and to everybody's surprise, it did surprise a lot of people uh, and, and woke everybody up to what the benefits of events can mean for Sheffield. And let's not forget, we've been doing major events and community events for 30 years previous to that. So it wasn't any surprise to those in the room it was a surprise to a lot of people. And then all of a sudden, a council that shall not be named suggested we went for the Eurovision Song Contest. Uh, I did cry a tear or two, I have to confess, as did we all. But the reality is that wouldn't have happened unless somebody had believed in themselves enough to say, we can do that, because everybody else thinks they can do it, so why don't we believe we can do it? And, and that's part of the, the challenge for us as a city. I know, this, I know this money, I get all those challenges. But... You know, we're now in the game of a lot of big events wanting to come to Sheffield, be they cultural events, sporting events, large-scale community events. We have a wealth of opportunities in this city where we could really create some wonderfully new large-scale community events in this city, as well as all the other community events that happen in the city as well. Um, and we have such a, a wealth of 
expertise, knowledge, both in event management and culture and art and music, and they're ready and waiting to engage with us on this journey. Uh, and for me, it, it, for once, the stars have aligned. I, I never thought they would in my career, to be candid. Uh, and as you said, I, th I think we're at a crossroads. We are at a crossroads. Um, and the opportunities will keep coming. They will keep coming from a city like Sheffield. Um, and uh, for me, now's the time. Now's the chance to grasp the nettle. Um, so, yeah, it, it, aspiration is everything. Because if you get the aspiration bit right, all the other stuff will follow. All the, the benefits, the economics, the social engagement, the profile, the people, the smiles on people's faces, they all follow. Laura, I think it's the last question. Um, well, Terry said a lot of what I wanted to say, so I'm not going to repeat that. However, I think there's a real issue here, the principle we've got to look at, which is the funding model. Um, I don't like looking at just top slicing budgets because I think sometimes you have to invest to create greater benefits. And what I'd like to see us do is look at what investments we would need to make. So instead of just looking at major events programme, what could we do? And put forward a case of certain events or certain activities that we could develop and what that would cost us. Because there is an opportunity cost here. Um, you know, I know we've got major problems, Adult social, uh, adult social care is intractable. We're not never going to solve that over the next 10, 20 years. But this could bring in, you know, this, this committee brings in more than any other and proportionate to, its, to the staffing, it's minuscule. We can't have a 10% budget cut here. We should be investing 10%. Um, so, and I know we're strapped for cash, but I think when we come into the budget discussions, these are some of the arguments we've got to make. And where else can we uh, generate income? The networks might come up with ideas. The ultimate beneficiaries in hospitality, could they contribute a percentage of, an, of their increased income? So I think we've got to look at everything, but I don't think all that will take time with the beneficiaries. I don't think now is the time to cut costs. I think we should be investing. Personally, I agree, but let's bring in Diana and Gary if they want to feed back on that. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you for that. I, I entirely agree with that. Um, and um, I think we're, what we're asking for is that we can do some work around that, that what that model might look like. It does take a lot of time to get to a position where you might get commercial income coming in. And we've had Brexit, COVID, cost of living crisis. So now isn't the time to lever that necessarily. But we think that's why we need maybe a three year plan or something to get to a point where actually other income could take hold. And so, um, yeah, very up for that conversation. Thank you. I was just. I was just thinking that um, the other thing possibly to note is when we do get the opportunity to bid for a major event, so I haven't been one of the people in the room about um, Eurovision, sometimes that comes from a centrally held corporate pot. I forget the correct name for it, but you know what I mean. So there is, if a major opportunity comes up, there is some flexibility. But... Um, yeah, I think the recommendation is, well, shall I read out the recommendations we have in front of us and then we can talk about that. So at the moment we're asked to note the current events program and the need for a proactive major events plan. I, I'm not, we've got this in front of us, colleagues, I'm not going to read it out verbatim. We're asked to note the interim position and how events are commissioned and funded. Specifically, we're asked to approve the development of a new major events plan and note that future updates and decisions will be brought back to this committee as required. I'm just wondering whether there's a recommendation that for, from the floor is to ask officers to look at the options and potential costs for a, a, an expansion or an enhancement of the current plan. 
I don't know whether that's the right wording. Terry, you, you have it. Sure, just kind of like an investor save on some of these events, as, as Laura said about the income generation on that. Um, I mean, there may be an opportunity through through the council and our investor save scheme that if we do kind of come back with a more um, um, business case type plan, there where we were able then to look at investors. So I don't know how you word that up, shall leave that to some other word, Smith, uh, to put him uh, possibly yourself. But but yeah, if we could put that to me, I think firms it up a little bit for us, haven't it? So, subject to a bit of wordsmithing around that, um, are those recommendations and that one we've just briefly discussed something that we can support? I'm seeing lots of nodding heads. Sorry, just a second, I need advice. Sorry, members, I think the the wording was um, to uh, request that officers um, examine and report back on uh, proposals or to to what we're saying. You, have, have a go, yeah. Here yeah. we go, here we go, we Laura, your turn. I think we should ask officers to examine the potential for enhancement of the major events plan and uh, associated cost and what the costs of that enhancement would would be in effect because that leaves everything including what Terry said open for examination Cherry I think that works well um, not least because if there were sort of staffing implications this wouldn't be the forum to, to air those in the first instance so so that, that, that for me works really well okay colleagues are we okay with that and um, officers, Gary's got you. In my world, I would call it an event horizon scanning exercise. What's out there in the next 10 years? What could we go for? What could we create? What would make a difference? Be it a community event or a world-class music event and anything in between. What do we know? What don't we know? And what could that cost? got two people here and then I'm going to go back to Amanda who's trying to keep a note of all this. Yeah, yeah because of its association with doom at the edge of a black hole, could we avoid the words event horizon in the document? <laughs> <laughs> this, Brian, this, can you beat that? <laughs> yes. Um, I'll have a go. Um, can we actually call, uh, call it uh, this is a it's a uh, opportunities register. This is what we voted for last year, I seem to remember. So each, and the idea being that each, each uh, committee, each department would come up with a way of raising money that allows us not to have to have cuts in the future as much as we do. And so identifying opportunities is part of that. So this is, a, this is a part of an opportunities register, surely. I, I I think we're straying into something that gets closer to a commitment to do something. So um, without knowing the costs involved, I might get <coughs> some advice from either side of me that you can't r recommend something without knowing what potential costs yeah. are. Can, can, can I clarify that in, in a sense, in saying that this is about gathering information for opportunities? That perhaps puts it a bit more looser. Can I go? Um, yeah, just, I mean, just really, just, just, a, just a very practical point. I mean, officers obviously taken note of that comment, those comments and <coughs> suggestions, and that might well form part of the, the comments in any report coming forward, rather than needing to be pinned into the recommendation itself. Yeah, I'd agreed with that. The um, horizon scanning and looking at the opportunities would be part of what we would do to develop the major events plan. The recommendation around looking at an expanded finance envelope I think is helpful for having an additional recommendation. So colleagues, I think we're all in violent agreement with each other yeah. and um, Amanda's scribbled something down there. Yeah. Um, we're reasonably confident with that. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go with it. Okay. Thank you very much, Gary and Diana.
we then come on to the final item on the agenda, which is the, uh, the budget and options. So um, that's yourself again, Diana. And just to remind colleagues, if we get into the specifics of the closed appendix, we may have to turn the cameras off. So if we can start off generally, um, but just have that in the back of our mind if we do want to get into the specifics. Diana. Thank you. And notice everyone's disappeared now we're talking about budget cuts. <laughs> I'm on my own. <laughs> Moral support, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So um, the report outlines the pressures that are in this year, um, sorry, next year, so 24-25 financial year for the Economic Development and Skills Committee. Um, it gives a flavour around where those um, pressures are coming from and then talks through the process that we've been going through to look how we can mitigate that within the committee's budget. Um, there was a report that went to um, SNR in, earlier in um, the year, in September, that looked at pressures. It talked around a pressure about £1 million for the economic development and skills um, budget. Since then, we've been working on this, looking to mitigate where we can. This report at 2.3 identifies that the remaining gap after the work that we've done already for the committee to be found is 495,000. The details of that pressure can be found in Appendix 1. Um, the report also notes um, that this committee does draw in a lot of external funding. A lot of the pay award pressures that all committees are feeling, we are able to charge out legitimately through our external contracts. And so the support that we need from the pay award is more minimal in this committee area. Um, section 3 talks about the savings proposals and the mitigations that we've looked at as a committee um, to offset some of this pressure. We've looked at fees and charges. Um, however... There's not a lot of fee generation within this area. We do, within the conference team, have um, a commissioning fee. However, that is set by a core cities benchmark. If we increase that, we will probably lose income because we'll be not competitive. Um, so it's not a normal type of fees and charges. So there's, there's nothing really in that area for um, us to kind of take any further. Appendix 2 goes through some further um, areas where we can make efficiency savings, particularly around business rates, and looks at the viability of stopping some services um, to meet the pressure within EDS. The report also notes um, at the end of Shared Prosperity Fund. It doesn't feel too long ago, uh, this time last year I was talking about the end of European funding um, and how we needed to replace that with Shared Prosperity Fund. And, Thank you for your work with us over the last kind of 18 months committee for securing all of that shared prosperity fund money and approving the programs. Um, however, it was only a three year program. So in March 2025, that does also run out and around 60% of the service is funded through these types of programs. So it's a big risk to kind of flag to the committee as well as the in-year pressures, there is that as well. That's not necessarily unusual for economic development departments. Um, we're always in this churn of where the next money is going to come from. But as that falls within a general election, there's a bit of a discontinuity there, which might mean the next funding pot that would replace Shared Prosperity Fund. We've not heard what's happening with that as yet. So in terms of the recommendations of the report, you are asked... Um, to note the recommendations from SNR for us to look at pressures within our own areas. Um, you're asked to note the financial pressures that EDS are talking about, which are in Appendix 1. Uh, note the areas that we've talked about as areas that we could mitigate against those pressures. Um, the report does highlight your um, recommendations to SMR. SNR as they take this decision going forward from our consultations we've done before this and to note the financial risk of the Shared Prosperity Fund. I think given the sen sensitivity of the, the stuff in the appendix, I will leave it at that for now. If you want to ask any further more detailed questions, we should probably move into a closed session. Thank you, Diana. Um, I've got Terry indicating and Henry, but is that... OK, before we go into that, are we talking... Are these questions about 
the open part of the report or the closed part, just to be very careful about that. Your, uh, the closed pressures? Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. I'll just take brief comments from Henry and Minesh, but I am aware that there is one issue that is definitely in the closed thing. Um, Henry, indicate the first, then Minesh. Uh, so in a very broad sense, to avoid going anywhere near any sensitive information. Um, once again, uh, we're hoping for some sunlit uplands that we were promised. I've not even seen any bus money coming from Whitehall, so if anyone down there is paying attention, um, it's a massive hole that not having the European funding has uh, left. SPF did what it could. It wasn't even comparable in scale, and you've done fantastic work with that funding available. And in a broad sense, what the committee does, what your team does, is very good in terms of income generation. It would be really um, re regressive to cut the funding because we're just shooting ourselves in the foot. Um, so hopefully it won't come to that. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to express my ire at the fact that the Sunday Uplands are looking pretty rainy and flooded at the minute. Thank you for that. I think that was a comment rather than a, a, a question. Um, comments that actually I agree with. Minesh? Sorry, Chair, mine was a proposal that we just moved to the closed discussion. I think that would be wise, um, rather than dancing around the handbags on this one. Yeah, okay. So, um, for members of the public, regrettably, we're going to have to close off the uh, webcast just while we discuss the closed appendix. Everybody okay with that? So, if we could double check. Okay, so... Um, Apologies to any members of the public that are looking at this either live or on the recording. Uh, we did have to go into a closed session to discuss one or two uh, confidential issues. Uh, colleagues, we have a number of recommendations in front of us. Um, they're on page 104 of the deck. I don't propose to read those out verbatim. If you'd just like to take a couple of seconds, this is in the public deck 104. Is that, are those recommendations something that we can agree on? D does anybody disagree? In that case, that's carried unanimously. And that concludes the meeting. Um, our next meeting is on the 20th of December. Brian, is it a quick one? Can we just thank the finance officers and Diana for the work that they've been doing on this? Please. It's clear. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you very much, colleagues. Have a pleasant evening. And thanks, guys, for your help.